fine with the way things are? Yep. Didn't you hear? The Bricks and I are getting married! I love you! God. Bandicoot month is full of surprises, isn't it? I mean, we come together to celebrate Crash, it's my birthday month, and now I'm getting married to a... a wall. How much better could everything possibly get? Nah, you don't want any of that. Huh? Who are you? I'm Jason Station. That is very funny. Why would you want to play Crash Bandicoot 4 when you've got so many of the best Crash games right here? Well, yeah, I suppose I do have all of these ones. I'm not talking about them. Say what? <coughs> well, that was just lovely. Oh, bugger me. Oh, look, it's Cash Banuka. That was all right, wasn't it? Oh, look, it's Cash Banuka 2. That was great, wasn't it? Oh, look, it's Cash Banuka Wrapped. Oh, look, it's Cash Teat Rabies. Oh, look, it's Cash Twitternity. These were fantastic, weren't they? Oh, look, it's Cash Banuka The Wrinkle of Cowpat. Oh, okay, that wasn't a very good one, was it? The lore of what I just came up with dictates that if you want a few games in a franchise to be respected as truly brilliant and given the eternal status of classic, you need to be able to compare it to its own failings so that you're able to see how badly its own gameplay style that the franchise is famous for can be attempted. Sure, people liked Crash Bandicoot 1 a lot when it came out. I mean, check out this kids magazine I have talking about the best games ever made. They seem to think that Crash 1 was one of them, so it must be true. I mean, look at what they say about Samus in Metroid. We know that playing as a girl is a bit, well, Girly. Ew, cuties. Real talk though, kids. Halo isn't a difficult game at all. You want to know what's really tough? SpongeBob. Why do I have this magazine? But no matter how much people loved Crash 1, when Crash 2 came out and refined and improved basically everything, it was clear where the original should have been from the very beginning, and it looks kind of bad now. But that's just hindsight. When Crash 2 came out in 97, you could only say that with the new knowledge you gained as a hardcore Dorito gammon, while gaming technology improved around you. Because at the time, nobody knew any better. This type of game was a new thing in 1996, so people didn't 100% know how good this new gaming formula could possibly get until they they experienced it for themselves. I mean, Jesus, people played Pog in 1972 and they thought that video games had peaked. That's it, guys. We're not getting any better than this. Pack up and go home. Wait, it's in colour now? And so it goes on. A sequel comes out, it improves itself. Another sequel comes out, it improves itself. And just when there's a few people that start complaining about that gameplay style getting a bit too repetitive and too old or stale, another sequel comes out which tries to fix all of those problems. Which then makes those complainers realise how good they had it in the first place. That's how I think gaming classics are born. You don't just finish making a game and then declare it classic immediately. Only time will tell. And nowadays, we all know the original Crash trilogy is classic because they remade them and they still hold up brilliantly today. The same can even be said about Crash's first attempt of a kart racer. Fantastic then, and fantastic as a remake even now. We also know these games are classics because its own series they came from really started pushing their luck when everyone started bitching about it. Now, where have I heard that before? Did someone call me? Yes, every franchise, whether it's about a purple dragon or a blue guinea pig, suffers from this problem of sinking really damn low when trying desperately to spice up what made their own games terrific in the first place. Even the portly Italian Pillsbury Doughboy wasn't safe from this trend. And even though it makes us respect and appreciate their good games even more, they still exist. And when it comes to Crash, bless his little belly baton, once Naughty Dog had nothing to do with him after four games in, nobody had a clue how to use him. Party games, open world games, more racing games, portable side scrollers, ideas that were picked up and dropped faster than my son, all in a desperate attempt to keep Crash relevant while completely ignoring what made him so popular and gave him a fan base to begin with. Did you ever wonder why the recently announced Crash 4 is carrying on from Crash 3 officially, despite Wrath of Cortex and Twin Sanity being labelled as Crash 4 and Crash 5 in Japan? All of these games are why, and we're gonna play them! Now, I have indeed taken a look Look at a few questionable games from Crash many years ago on this channel. Wrath of Cortex was one of them, and I'm not going to bother looking at it in this video because I already went through it top to bottom in depth not that long ago. But suffice it to say, aside from the great controls, the enemies are pathetic and can barely touch you, the bosses from Crash 3 do nothing but poke you, Cortex's eyebrows have a mind of their own, the levels are way too big, Coco gets stuck floating in boxes, Monkey Bar swinging is slower than corpse decomposition, your eyes escape your head and float in midair, and Crash looks like an inflatable sex doll, which makes me want to be sick in my mouth. There's also this one level here where you can 
beat it to get the crystal by just letting go of the controller. Yes, I'm not joking about that. This is supposed to be a minecart race where you pick different routes to take to try and get in front of Crunch, and you don't need to press a single button and you will win. This game is a masterpiece. I also did do a video on Crash Bash, but that was back in 2012. 2012. That was even before YouTube was taken over by Susan Wetwinky. And because that video is <laughs> terrible, I figured I'd drop myself into this video nice and gently and revisit Crash Bash to see if it really was the beginning of Crash's downfall after Naughty Dog dropped him to start making games about angry hairy men. So I guess it's time to conclude this year's Bandicoot Month by acknowledging all of Crash's failures and getting them out of the way forever so that I never have to mention them again. These games I'll be talking about today have been heavily requested on my channel for years now, so sorry for the wait. I hope this is what you wanted. Oh wow, check it out. It's Crash and Bash em. I reviewed this game when I was a clean-shaven child. The graphics as well are actually quite pleasant. The characters look good, and I don't know what I was talking about. This was the first Crash game to be picked up by another random developer after Naughty Dog lost the rights of the character to Universal, and that does spell bad news at the offset, but at least the new devs, Eurocom, didn't try to poorly replicate the original formula. They instead tried to do a Mario Party, but with a gorilla with an anus for a face. Doesn't mean the game is great though, despite it doing its own thing, because, spoiler warning, I don't think it's that great. Can we judge the game by the first world of adventure? No. We can't. Ignore him. Now even though Crashly Bashly is a party game, if you're all by yourself, you can indeed play a single player adventure mode. Ooh, get you. And in adventure mode, I decided to pick Cortex because when he's running, his hands turn into a canary. But you can't call this an adventure without a story. I mean, what do you think this game is? Hiking. So the intro cutscene clues us in on what's going on. In the most basic of terms, Aku Aku and Uka Uka are having an argument, which almost leads to the worst boxing match of all time because none of them have any arms. Prepare to fight! No, Uka Uka. The ancients would not allow it. Ah, do you know what? Aku Aku is right. Yeah, we've never done that before at all. No, we don't fight because the ancients won't let them do it. No, not even once. Don't want to piss off those ancients. Oh, by the way, who are the ancients? You know what's even weirder about this, though? The first line spoken in this cutscene is... How many times? Times must you be told? You cannot defeat me. So why does Uka Uka even try to fight Aku Aku after all of that? Why give him the ancient's excuse? You both can't hurt each other. Aku Aku said so. Do you have memory loss, Uka Uka? Can Wood get Alzheimer's? Anyway, after this, Aku Aku has had enough and is about to bring the thunder. This bickering can go on no longer. Or he's gonna sound like a fed up mother. And logically, just like when you catch your own kids bickering, there's only one way to settle it. ILLEGAL CAGE FIGHTING! <laughs> yes, instead of settling this tiny squabble between themselves, these omnipotent and all-powerful masks decide to STEAL their supposed friends and pit them against each other until only one is left alive. And Crash is A-OK -okay with it. What is he doing? <laughs> And so, by winning a random set of battle party games and fighting boss levels at the end of each warp room, your chosen character must beat out the competition for the glory of their own mask that forced them into this horror, and this somehow proves how great they are and who wins this pissy little argument. Even stranger though is that since I picked Cortex, I'm fighting for the evil side, and yet the boss levels are all the same if you picked the hero side. Even Uka Uka says in the boss cutscenes, You must first meet an old friend. So if they're old friends, why are we fighting the bosses? If the bosses are evil and friends with Uka Uka, including the final boss, doesn't that mean that the evil side already wins this argument by default? What's going on? Why are we fighting them? Oh, don't worry, he's flat now. This story is a total disaster. No other words. It's as much of a mess as Tiny Tiger's character model. Cortex's hair, though, is on point. Look at it. It's so on point that it is a point. His hair is so sharp he could open an envelope with it. So Crash to Coot Bash to Coot, like I mentioned earlier, is Mario Party for the entirety of the gameplay, but without the game board or dice to roll, and it's worse. You just win mini games over and over again to progress. And where some of these games on their own are totally passable and fun in their own right, where Crash Bash fails is with the T of it all. This is one of the most repetitive games I've ever played. In fact, it's so repetitive that in the first warp room, you get four-way pong, polar bear fighting, pogo stick bouncing, and 3D brawling. And then in the second warp room, you get four-way pong, polar bear fighting, pogo stick bouncing, and 3D brawling. Foon! Sure, there's an additional game mechanic added in for the copies, but they're still copies. They feel exactly the same to play. And many of these mini-games are copied up to three times throughout the adventure mode in different warp rooms, with nothing but a different coat of paint. And that's not all. Get this. In order to unlock the boss battles from each warp room, you need a certain amount of trophies. And no, your wife doesn't count. To get the trophy on one of these levels, you need to win the mini-game in question, not once, not twice, 
but three times. And this isn't a best out of three system or anything like that. The game keeps on going until anybody in the match wins three times, meaning that you could potentially replay the level nine times in a row in order to win just one trophy. And that's assuming you even win on the ninth attempt. La -dee -da -dee -da -dee -da. So you get the four trophies from Warp Room 1, unlock Boss 1, and then think to yourself, God damn, I can't wait to see something new. And then, oh dear, Warp Room 2 has exactly the same minigame style as you just did, aside from one extra level you haven't seen before, and you still need to win them all three times each. And then all of a sudden, Boss 2 won't let you in, because you need trophies, gems, and crystals to get inside. But where do you get the gems and crystals from, you bitch? Why? By going back through all the levels you've already replayed a million times over and replaying them again. But this time with an overly frustrating crutch, like randomly growing insta-kill mushrooms taking over the stage, or you beginning the stage with less health than everybody else. Yes, Engine, this is a great idea. When two giant missile-equipped mech suits can't take down a tiny bandicoot, just spin around and spit balls out of your mouth, I'll get them. So yeah, the single-player adventure mode, aside from the decent bosses, pretty horrendous. And unfortunately, unless you own a first edition black labeled European version of Crash Bash, like I do, there's no code you can put in anywhere to unlock all of the multiplayer games straight away if you want to just jump into a match with a few friends. You have to go through the adventure mode and unlock everything in that tedious goddamn way. Otherwise, you're stuck with four mini games total with four different skins. And that is it. Unless you have a copy of Spyro 3. Yes, stay with me. By holding L1 and R2 on the title screen for Spyro 3 and pressing square, you get access to a hidden Crash Bash demo. And then, if you type in a specific code on the title screen of the demo, you are then granted access to a cheat menu, where you can not only manipulate and change basically everything on the screen, but also have access to nearly every single level, fully multiplayer compatible and all. You are missing a few of the final mini games, and you only have three bosses to pick from, boss three of which apparently being Homer Simpson. <laughs> But yes, essentially, nearly the entire Crash Bash game is hidden on a Spyro 3 disc, which I guess just goes to show you how little space Crash Bash's full disc was using in the first place, and therefore shows you how much effort went into it. I can't believe they left this here accidentally. It's so damn cool. Look, you can even see the exact date and time that this beta build of the game was placed onto the Spyro 3 disc. How adorable. Aww. Okay, what I just said about the no effort thing, that was harsh. There is quite a bit of effort put into some of Crash Bash. The soundtrack, for instance, is one of Crash's best on the PS1. In fact, below Crash 2, I'd say it was the second best, so go and check it out. And when you do have all the mini games unlocked, it is a decent distraction with friends, but getting to that point legitimately, which the majority of players of this game had to do, is hellish. And my lord, aside from the repetition and copy-paste mini games, the looks of this game really end up burying it. Too many freeze frames I was able to grab from this game were absolutely horrifying and a far cry from the detail you'd expect from the Crash universe, even on the PS1. And come on, man, Cortex's head here looks like a boy egg on top of a frisbee. I can see a good game here. But it's not in there. And that's probably the saddest thing. Oh, I don't know. Maybe if I shout at it, it will be better. Oi! That didn't work. But don't fret. I mean, did you like Crash Team Racing? Yeah? Good. Well, have I got the steal for you? Because for the low, low price of Three, you can get Crash Team Racing, but on the PS2 with better graphics, and you fall through the floor all the time! Oh yes, sign me up! Banuka boy. So Crash Nitro Kart was sort of a sequel slash spiritual successor to Crash Team Racing for the PS2 era, and oh boy does it feel like a game stuck in the shadow of its better big brother that the parents love more. In many ways this is just a carbon copy of Crash Team Racing, but just not as good. It's even apparent in the adventure mode. The plot of CTR is aliens, and the plot of Nitro Kart is aliens, but instead of Oxide threatening to turn Earth into a giant concrete parking lot, you have this guy called Velo who just steals you to race a bunch of times to entertain other aliens on another planet. That's basically it. And his beard is the shape of the first letter of his name. I mean, what kind of asshole does that? Nitro Kart does actually give you a good first impression. Instead of making you pick one character only for the entire adventure, like in CTR, you get to pick from either Team Bandicoot or Team Cortex, allowing you to swap between three different characters with their own unique driving styles and kart stats whenever you want to in between all of the races. And that's not all. You even get unique cutscenes for each team throughout the story mode based on who you pick. But then you realise that they didn't bother to fix the facial animations for the mask. You will have to race in order to win the galaxy circuit and save Earth for us to conquer! Welcome to the future of gaming, everyone! This is the PS2-
Hey! What's my name? Easy. Sloppy. Because that's what this game is. And that's a massive shame to me, because as far as pushing the Crash Kart racing games forward goes, Nitro Kart gave us a fair amount new and good. This was the game that introduced a new boost formula, where the closer you leave the drift meter to the burnout, the faster boost you're rewarded with. A brilliant risk and reward system that they later brought back for Nitro Fuel. They gave us unique track designs with trap crates to break that activate different obstacles on the track to sabotage other players. There are some great new items like the tornado that picks up anybody it touches and goes around half the track. There's anti-gravity gimmicks in the levels that Mario would later copy in Mario Kart 8 11 years later. The adventure mode has this frenzy system where a meter slowly charges with your teammates throughout the race, after which you're able to use as many random items as you can before the timer runs out. The visuals can be absolutely breathtaking for a PS2 game, and hell, they even brought back the staples from CTR that made the adventure mode stand out in the first place, like the three token collection races, crystal grabbing arenas, and the time trial relic races. <laughs> And since they already copied so much that worked from CTR, it would only make sense for them to copy the addictive, maniacal and bouncy control style. But they don't. Nitro Kart feels like the developers witnessed the birth of a miracle child, and while the mother was still splayed, shoved it back in. Nitro Kart is an unbirthed baby that was already born. I need therapy. Even though you're not playing the game right now, you can probably see the downgrade just from the footage. Nitro Kart has absolutely no sense of speed or heaviness to the cart to make it feel like you're burning rubber against the terrain. It feels like you're floating along it. It's very flat and unreactive, which wouldn't be so bad if the jumping and drifting didn't feel limp and splatty, and the turning didn't feel like you were unfolding an ironing board, but it does. Especially with the highest speed, lowest turn characters, unless you're drifting, it barely feels like you even turn at all, and you even slow down if you hold a turn for too long, because clearly someone thought you weren't going slow enough. Even driving into the levels is a pain. Driving into the levels is difficult. Stop judging me, it's very hard. Why are you looking at me like that engine? <laughs> <laughs> oh look, we've got a boss race heading our way. I wonder who will be fighting from the Crash Universe today. Yeah! Oh. Him. This delightful little cherub is called Crunk. Don't know who he is? Neither do I. And instead of being introduced in a comically personalised way, where he's talking directly to the camera and intimidating the player, he instead gets forced into racing us by Velo. And then he says, Nah, I don't want to race them, they're smelly. And then Velo says, Oh, come on, please, Daddy. And then Kronk says yes. Uh, yeah, that is the quality of the boss races we have in Nitro Kart. And as for the race itself, well, I've got to be honest, I'm not even sure it was a race. See you later, monkey beta. At this point, I'd rather have a race against that thing in Star Fox 64 called Bacon. The pathetic boss races aren't all either when it comes to the difficulty of Nitro Kart. In fact, when you mix in the team frenzy mechanic and new boost formula that is outright broken when you get the hang of it, this ends up becoming the easiest kart racer I think I've ever played. And the boss races don't even allow you to use frenzy, so that's how easy they are. Topping all of this off is a piddling number of tracks compared to CTR as well. Oh, that did not feel good. And I don't even want to know what noise you'd make if you did feel good. And even though this is supposed to be a high-tech advanced PS2 follow-up to Crash Team Racing, Nitro Kart ends up being one of the most unpolished games I've ever played. Constantly clipping through the floor is one thing, but it's another thing when the frame rate tanks whenever there's more than three carts on the same screen. The shields don't even work half the time, and in some races you're even able to crash. How the hell did you do that? I genuinely love the track designs and the visuals of Nitro Car, but even if you can get past the performance problems, there's no point coming back to this whatsoever since it controls worse than Crash Team Racing and doesn't feel as good to play, which in a kart racer I would argue is the main thing you need to get right. That's why games like Mario Kart 64 or Double Dash hold up so well after all these years. Yeah, they put some of the tracks from these games in the future installments, but you can always feel safe going back to these ones because you know you're going to be having a great time controlling the carts. Oh, and by the way, the loading screens are terrifying. Crash is dead. <laughs> Oh wow, look at that! It's a bonus platform! You know what that means? Yeah, we've got an extra racing game to look at! So welcome everybody to the Cadicorous Bounds Round! <laughs> Yep, just when you thought they couldn't mess it up anymore and that they should have let Crash Team Racing die with dignity, here we have another Crash Kart racer, Tag Team Racing. But it's okay, because Jetix Magazine says it's the best Crash game ever. And everyone knows who Jetix Magazine is. Hey everyone, it's me, your favourite primetime family friendly YouTube superstar, Jump! So immediately, I do have to give Tag Team Racing some credit. The story mode here is at least something different and not another random Alien. invasion. The plot here is that you're battling Cortex and accidentally stumble into a theme park built entirely for roller coasters and racetracks. 
Is that a wang? And you get roped into recovering the power sources for each of the theme park's lands that were mysteriously stolen from Von Clutch over here. But we're only helping him to do that because whoever does help him wins ownership of the entire park, which Cortex really wants to do, and we can't let him do that. Perhaps a rebel or two! <laughs> That's my trolley pack mascot, Lily Wumper Cheeks. That sounds like a character from an adult movie. Smash Brandy's cooch. Yeah, probably that one. So Tag Team Racing is yet another crash kart racer, if you couldn't tell. It's CTR and Nitro Kart again, but with a million extra pointless mechanics, and in my opinion, it's even worse. The car controls are un bearably stiff, the track designs are the opposite of interesting, the shortcuts barely mean anything, the music is boring, the engaging and skill-based jumping drift to boost system has been totally removed and replaced with an awful power slide move that doesn't even help that much and makes this noise whenever you use it. <laughs> But the worst thing about it, to me at least, is the main gimmick that separates this racer from the rest, the clashing system. In any race at any time, the character you pick can turn into a ghost and clonk their way into another car of your choosing to merge with them. And as we all know, nobody can clink the clonk as good as Crash Bedinky Donk. By doing this, you briefly turn the game into Mario Kart Double Dash but for war criminals, since you can swap between driving the car or aiming a weapon that has now attached itself onto the car in order to blow up everyone else until you run out of ammo. On paper, this sounds like the cool coolest edition ever, it's like Crash Team Racing meets Twisted Metal, especially since there's plenty of characters with unique weapons, there's loads of vehicle types with different defense speed and handling options, and plenty of unique visual combinations for certain carts clashing together. But all of this falls apart like soggy bread once you realize that you only need to clash with one car, and then you've automatically won every single race. Engine. Oh! You see, Engine's weapon he has are these rockets, and they are so overpowered, I'm pretty sure they could be used in tactical warfare. With these rockets, you mow everybody down with no effort, one to two hits max with splash damage. And whenever you're gunning, the CPU in the driver's seat goes around the track as perfectly as possible. So just make sure you fire the rockets, detach from your host like a dying flea right before the end of the third lap because you get thrown forward every time you do detach, and then you'll find that you win every single time. When you're in this state, you you are in complete control. You are a parasite. The helpless sap you attach to can't ever force you off. There's no time limit for this or penalty for overusing it. You can use overpowered race items in conjunction with the rockets. If you get blown up by other races, you recover two seconds later, still in the clash formation. And the best thing, if you run out of rockets, you can always detach and then immediately reattach again to get all of your ammo back. Sure, you can always switch driving positions and let the computer player shoot down the bogeys, but why would you do that when you can effortlessly get rid of the competition and not have to deal with the painfully unsatisfying driving mechanics. You could always say that this is an optional mechanic, I suppose, I except it isn't, because if you don't clash with another car in any race, then you're a very weak target to every other car firing at you, and you explode so much as tumbleweed touches you. Not to mention, again, you're stuck with kart racing mechanics that feel like you're derailing a train, and other racers can attach themselves to you at random with as much consent as a Weinstein. Basically, if you don't clash, you lose, so why wouldn't you choose to clash with the most powerful weapon race? And then, once you unlock Engine shortly into the game, it all becomes even easier since you don't even need to look for him in the race to grab his rockets. You can clash at the very start of the race to guarantee victory with any car without breaking a sweat. Look at these KOs. Look at these KOs. For a three lap race lasting around three minutes, this means I was averaging seven KOs per minute. And so at this point, why does the track design matter? Why do the visuals matter? Why do the shortcuts matter? For even a small fighting chance in tag team racing, you have to use this clash mechanic, which means you'll end up doing the same thing repeatedly to win every time. Even the other modes for each track have similar approaches to them. Oh, and did you know? This game is a platformer? Yeah, Tag Team Racing also has a giant hub world that's as much of a single game as the racing itself, despite being called Tag Team <coughs> RACING! And my god, look at this. Look at this performance. The game didn't run spectacularly in the races, but this here, this looks worse than my granddad's slippers. Couldn't you guys just focus on getting one gameplay style nailed instead of forcing as much in as possible? Did I just die from jumping into a bridge? The jumping and general running around control are so slippery and floaty, it's practically impossible to control where you're aiming towards. And even the spinning attack is lazy. See this? This isn't a death tornado spin power up from the other games. This isn't a super spin. This is just what happens when you hit square over and over again. The animation resets and you can keep spinning forever, meaning that no enemies will give you any trouble. No shits were given at all, my lumpies and germs. You also get interrupted a lot by Chick and Stu. <laughs> Who you may recognize from Nitro Fueled is the chickens who announce all the DLC Grand Prix. 
I hate them there, and I hate them even more here. Spend it like crazy on new stuff. Bling, bling. Bling, bling. Yeah, that's what all the kids were saying back then, wasn't it? Bling, bling in my ding, ding. To be totally fair to Tag Team, though, despite not being that fun to control, I do admire a few things they do in this overworld system. Firstly, they turn the death animations Crash is famous for into an explorative gameplay mechanic, as you can go on a scavenger hunt looking for hidden specific death cutscenes that quite often got a chuckle out of me. Oh look, it's Flat Bandicoot. Secondly, these are some pretty expansive and densely designed hub worlds, especially on the vertical plane, and all the pockets of coins you find are able to purchase more outfits for your characters, more cars, and even a few crystals that you need in order to open the gates that will take you to the next power gem you need to progress to the next world. There's a reason to explore other than finding the next race, and I like that. You can also physically abuse the customers in the park, which is very cathartic because I used to work in retail, and the amount of times I wanted to take the head off of a customer and kick it like a football is uncountable. You can even kick the children! This is a 7 plus game with child beating! Actually, is this how old you need to be to play the game, or how many years in prison you'll get for child abuse? I failed! You know what though, now that I think about it, the balance is a bit too skewed in the platforming's favour, because winning a race only rewards you with two crystals, whereas you're gonna be able to buy and find more hidden crystals in the overworld much faster in order to open up all these gates in the hub world so then find the hidden power gems and skip a huge chunk of the game without even doing a single race. Welcome to Crash Tag Team Racing where we don't like racing. Overall though, Tag Team Racing is an absolute mess, and in my opinion, one of the lowest points of Crash's console career. It tries to appeal to everyone, but ends up impressing no one. Half of it is Crash Team Racing, but with worse controls, worse performance, worse visuals, broken mechanics, and boring, stale track design, while the other half is Twin Sanity, but with worse controls, worse performance, worse visuals, worse enemies, and barely any really challenging platforming. Hey, I'm a girl! Yeah, Crash, what's wrong with you? Women can't fight back! Yo ho ho in a bottle of Wumpa Whip! Is it rude to say that I hate you? Hey Caddy, look over here! I'm Charlie Window! I'm not in the mood for this, can you please give me the next game? Oh, okay. I just wanted to let some light into your world. Can you give me the next game? Okay, fine. Don't be such a glass hole. <laughs> give me the next- Go get it! <laughs> Skylanders Imaginators? This isn't a Crash game! Mm. Well, this cartoon says otherwise. Cartoon? You don't even know the half of it, mate! Oh, no! Extreme Rescue Mission! <laughs> oh, my god, what is this? I was on the Wampa Islands and about to free my friend Tana from the clutches of the evil Dr. Neo Cortex! Is this show trying to get a rise out of me? Because it's working! You can make a strong argument in favor of that show! You're getting a rise out of me, Skylanders! Yep, oh, I'm angry! I'm rising! I'm rising! I'm rising like a souffle! I'm sorry, but what in God's unholy pants is this? I don't care if this show is any good. Judging by this inclusion of Crash, I really don't care. Pure and simple, this is not Crash Bandicoot. This is not the point of his character. He's a mute dumbass meant to tribute other mute dumbasses in old Warner Brothers cartoons. To not only give him a voice, but a brain is completely missing the point. Crash is planning. He doesn't plan. He eats the things he's supposed to be collecting. This is gonna be controversial, I know, but I honestly prefer the horrible Crash 2 promo video version of Crash over this, because at least Crash wasn't a fully established character at that point, and he was still an idiot in that. <laughs> they could have used anybody here if they needed a character like this. It shouldn't have been Crash. Hashtag not my Banuka. But don't worry, these fever dream clips from the Skylanders TV show is not what I'm going to be looking at today. Instead, I'll be taking a look at the game that the show was based on. For those who don't know, Skylanders is a series of simple 3D beat-em-up platforming games in the Spyro mythos, kind of like LEGO Star Wars in terms of style and feeling, except that it requires the use of a USB portal device in order for you to place different figures onto the portal and have them pop up in the game. Different figures have different abilities to get by different obstacles and unlock different secrets, and on its own I don't think it's too offensive, it's a cute little idea, but in 2016 when we were constantly teased a Crash game on PS4 after 8 years of 
of silence to then have Sony go on stage and just mention casually, oh yeah, we're working on some remasters, and then go off and show a trailer for a game which had nothing to do with Crash directly, but instead had him as a cameo with one additional level to that game, felt like a little bit of a joke. People were not happy about this announcement back then. Remember, this was before we had seen anything to do with the Insane trilogy, and after all of the games that had spiralled Crash off downhill. This was Crash's official PS4 comeback, so to see him coming back on PS4 but in a children's toy collecting game was a bit of a bait and switch. But hey, at least the figures are pretty awesome, I love these little things. I also accidentally bought four. Before we get onto the Crash content though, let's take a look at the game as it is. The story of Skylanders Imaginators is that Spyro is having a race, and then evil comes in and stops the race, and by the way, the character design of Spyro makes me wet in a bad way, so I guess it's now time for me to pick up my figures and place them onto the portal. Oh my god, it's magic! Look! Look, look who it is! From my toy! It's Crash Burger! I've gotta say, it's very bizarre to see Spyro and Crash running around together in a game that isn't- <laughs> But I welcome it, it looks weirdly natural here, and since we're in a beat em up, I really love how most of the moves Crash is famous for are translated into fighting moves that can be purchased with the coins that you collect. From super spinning to belly flopping and even sliding, it's all here, just not giving you the same utility as in the platforming games. I kinda like Crash here, honestly, I mean, he's a bit of a chunky monkey, but in this world and art style, he fits in quite nicely. Except whenever you pause the game. <laughs> Crash, are you having a stroke? Your design, however, I'm sorry, your design is disgusting. Your face looks like a pug that was stung by a wasp. So I'm gonna switch over to Cortex and shoot some holes in it. <laughs> Throughout the game, you can activate different shrines to give the figures you have new moves to play with. And to be frank, I thought it would be a case of unlocking one universal move for an entire class of figure to use. But as it turns out, you not only get unique moves for each character of each class, but even a unique cutscene of them getting it. This is a level of effort I can respect here. So this is called the Mysterious Ancient Place. And you have a mysterious ancient face. Oh, and before we carry on, I just wanted to mention how cool this little feature is. This here is a gem figure. And not only does it light up when you place it on the portal, I like the pretty lights. But it also allows you to create and store your very own Skylander that has a specific class based on the coloured gem that you have. And this is as extensive as a bloody Bethesda game. Look at this! Individual body proportions, accessories, weapons, skin, and my favourite, the voice. Here's my hero. Do you like her? She's an armor-wearing, ram-horned snake woman with a fire bow, and I called her Fromage. A name that will echo through the ages. Fromage! So after we pass the first story stage, we're then let loose in the main hub world, which is when we then unlock the entire reason I picked up this stupid overpriced Playmobil set, the Thumping Wumpa Islands. It's its own exclusive level within Skylanders Imaginators with exclusive cutscenes and its own mini story to get through, featuring specialised obstacles and items, nice easy puzzles to break up the gameplay, and even the classic boxes to break for Crash. I have some news. Your old friend Spiral- What? You mean the one I threw Molotovs at? There's tons of easter eggs, subtle nods and references to the older games, really pretty visuals, and a decent sense of humour to boot. Wow, the real Crash Bandicoot came all the way out here to see my prized great collection! So it sounds really great so far, right? Well, I'm afraid it kind of isn't. This is the slowest thing I think I've ever touched. And I touched the floor yesterday! Look, say what you want about the quality of the gameplay or the ethics behind Crash being in Skylanders after an eight year gap of nothing. Regardless if you love or hate Skylanders, how can anybody be okay with the slug-like speeds you move? Isn't this supposed to be a fast-paced action game for kids? I run pretty quick in the home world, what's going on over here? And I know this is for kids, but hey, the original trilogy were for kids too, and they were never this easy. You just run around and hit stuff with like two or three buttons while doing the occasional jump repeated ad nauseum. It really is baby's first beat-em-up, and that wouldn't be so bad except you move along as fast as cheese on toast. It doesn't matter what extra moves you purchase or whatever, you still end up doing the simplest button-mashing combos and nothing else. And often that's the best way to get past any combat encounter because the singular powerful moves that take a long time to wind up don't do as much damage as a quick 1-2-3 combo with your basic punches. And annoyingly, the slowness coupled with the repetitive simplicity is what ends up ruining so many more encounters throughout the game. At this point, you 
you don't have a guard, dash, or roll, just a run, jump, and attack. So tanking hits in big crowds is inevitable. Look, they all move faster than you, and in situations like this, there is nothing you can do other than die and swap out to another figure that you may or may not have on you. The only way to get your old character back being to quit the level or restart it. So I hope you have enough figures, kids, or else you'll need to steal mummy's credit card. This then becomes a huge problem when you're told, Only Crash Bandicoot can unlock this zone. But the problem is, he got steam pressed earlier, which means I would need to start my entire 30 minutes of playtime so far all over again in order to reach that point to open the door as Crash. While going through all of the sticky, running, enemy smacking, property destroying and puzzle solving all over again. You know what this game reminds me of? Over the Hedge on the Xbox. And if you're reminding me of Over the Hedge, you are buggered it up! But this isn't what everyone wanted me to talk about, is it? <sighs> okay, fine. I guess it was only a matter of time. These two final games I'll be looking at for this video have been requested by my viewers, no joke, for over eight years now. And to celebrate me finally getting around to talking about them, I invited a celebrity guest to show you what the first one is. Thanks for that, Billy Willy. Now I'm just gonna put my name in, which is Egg. Oh, great. Here we go, everyone. Crash of the Titans. Okay, so this intro cutscene I actually really like. This shadow puppet art style with no dialogue is a very unique way to set up the story, even if it reminds me a bit too much of Jungle Book 2. And I don't ever want to be reminded of Jungle Book 2. <laughs> Okay, so should I start addressing the obvious? That being these... questionable character designs? I'm sorry everyone, I know this version of Crash has his fans, but not me. This is a standing up orange hyena with tattoos. I mean, who does that? Tattoos are for pricks! He's dressed up like a rejected member of Green Day, and his entire aura reeks of the mid-2000s. There's no timelessness here. I still don't know why they did this, and I don't know what's up with the voices either. Crunch is like if Tony the Tiger was played by Mr. T. I'm a blink. Cut your mouth when you sneeze. But hey, at least Cortex is still pretty funny. There is always that. Make a sucker! Hey, genius. I can't actually hear you. I'm really far away, and I'm flying like a hovercraft or something. And I don't hate the new Aku Aku here, I can still tell that it's him, but that face he pulls when he's shielding you is a little DEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEEE
slash possessing monsters being called jacking. And it doesn't matter how good your game is at that point, if it's boring, you've lost me. I mean, at least Skylanders, for as slow as that game is, allowed you to collect coins and spend them on upgrades that you wanted to choose. Here, you don't get a choice, you just keep collecting these blue balls and then you'll eventually unlock some kind of new move and that's it there's no strategy or thought to any of this or any concrete reasons to explore i'm being serious when i say this this is the crash version of sonic boom yes a fundamentally boring and unengaging beat-em-up with no thought required basic platforming new character designs new unexplained abilities and a new universe for the characters to explore that's given no build-up backstory or context only difference is in crash of the titans you don't disappear and do you want to see where i couldn't take it anymore right damn here. This is apparently Uka Uka. Yes, this Uka Uka. Way to completely toss aside your old fans that you're still trying to attract back into the series after the platforming apparently got too stale. I mean, I think that it's a cool as hell mask design on its own, but that is not Uka Uka. I will take the mojo and bandicoot female back to our base. That's my nan. And Cortex, my goodness. You know, I've heard people complain about Cortex's look in Crash Bandicoot 4, and here I am saying, huh? You serious? You could always end up looking like this. Cortex here looks like a cross between a toddler and an old man. Or a... Balding Pinocchio. Aha! Bonjour everyone and welcome back to my show. It's me, Sam Witch. And today, we're going to be cooking up all of the shit that you never wanted to eat. Sticking it in the microwave and reheating it for you. <laughs> Oh, mind over mutant. Come on then, let's get this over with. My name is... Limes. The first mission of this game is a tutorial gauntlet where Crash's sister Coco sends us off to look for a load of Coco parts, and I really don't think her brother should be doing that. After that, I hate to report, it's exactly the damn same game as Titans. No exaggeration, it's the same game. Except Crash overdid the steroids in his shins. And now he has short shorts. Is that a lump? Oh wait, no, I'm telling a lie. There is something else a little bit different here. There's, um, a kid's art pack? What's all of this then? <laughs> oh wow, are these fan arts from children that they hid in the menus of this game just to be cute? Oh dear. Crashes in a mankini. You know what? I'm gonna call it. I don't think this is kids fan art. I'm willing to bet that this was official concept art because holy crap, this is the worst design of Crash I think I've ever seen. He looks like a gangly 30 year old man dressed up as Crash Bandicoot, not actually him. The limb proportions are all wrong. He looks way too humanoid. He's too tall. And again, people complained about Crash 4 or the insane trilogy even. Just look at this climbing animation. Look at it. Is this Crash Bandicoot or the Exorcist? To be fair to Mind Over Mutant though, even even though it is the same game as Titans and the character designs have been left in the toilet, I've got to say, this is basically just a better version of Titans when it comes to the gameplay. From the start, you've got way more fighting moves to work with, including a last minute dodging and counter attack move to really let you get into the combat mechanics and let you think about what buttons you have to press. And you get more moves for all the platforming you'll be doing, the platforming itself being 10 times more interesting and involved than in Crash of the Titans, feeling a lot like twin sanity in places actually. Not to mention, hijacking the Titans for fighting has more uses, since they don't only have their own unique special moves that can not only benefit you in combat, but also aid you in exploration and getting to secret areas. Even better, you can jump on and off any titan you want to at any time and store them on your equipping slot, and you just need to press the equip button again to get straight back on them, making the flips between combat and crash exclusive climbing and platforming feel way more natural and of the moment. The titans feel like an extension to crash instead of just something that you do every so often. You're not just going through the motions and hitting a single attack button over and over again. This is not half bad. I'd happily play this over Titans anyway, but at the end of the day, it is still a simplistic kids beat em up game, no escaping it, and it's really damn easy. Another person balancing on the other end would make it much easier. Oh, was I... Was I not supposed to be able to do that? And to be perfectly honest, for as monotonous and mindless as this game does inevitably become, I won't lie, I thought it was a little bit worth it to watch all of the cutscenes linking each level segment together. These are the best cutscenes in any Crash game, no kidding. And for each level, they're done in a different cartoon style. There's flash animation, hand puppets, old and timey, and the scripting, voice acting, and characterization is perfect. I'd even argue it's better than what Twin Sanity had to offer in terms of humor. Just check out some of the gags that they somehow got away with here and tell me that you didn't crack a smile. Yes, it is I, Embryo. 
My name sounds like fetus. Call now and you'll also receive Neckbeard in a can. Can't talk? Watching monkeys. Look at the monkey. Oh, right in his own mouth. Stare and dream. <laughs> Stare and dream. Soon to be available everywhere but Arkansas. Punch him in the throat. Not my throat. I need that for swallowing. These are all so fast-paced, funny, expressive, and creative that I'm pretty convinced that Mind Over Mutant was originally supposed to be an animated series or something, but got rejected at the pretense of it being for a character from a video game, and so they were told by executives that they would prefer a video game, so then they just copied and pasted the ideas and mechanics from Crash of the Titans into here so that they could show you all the animated sequences they made. I don't know. I smell a conspiracy here. Oh, hang on. That's just fish. I'm in the market. So I wasn't expecting this in the slightest, but this mini marathon of the post-Naughty Dog Crash Bandicoot games ended on a weirdly positive note. Mind Over Mutant is not that bad. I mean, it's not great, I wouldn't go out of my way to willingly play it again, but it's a lot better than the other toss we've seen today. But overall, when you see the Crash Bandicoot 4 announcement trailer and hear this little exchange at the end of it... How many times have you beaten this clown anyway? Three. Really? Only three? <laughs> Funny. Seemed like more. I can totally understand now why they decided to split the timeline after Crash 3 and pretend like the other games didn't happen. However good or bad you think these games were as the next main Crash installments, nobody can deny that they were all over the bloody place in terms of focus and direction, which eventually led to the original trilogy getting the insane remakes in the first place. People just wanted to go back to the good solid stuff that everyone knew, everyone loved, was really tightly designed, and what made Crash great and lovable to begin with. None of this sack. <coughs> Crunch. Uh, what the hell are you looking at right there? Hmm, yes, that is a nice chest. The racing games were kept on life support for far too long, Titans was a dated bore, Mutant was a mediocre attempt to keep that new gameplay style going, and Skylanders wasn't even a Crash game. The only one I can see some potential in is with Crash Bash, considering how long-lasting Mario Party has been, and how well-received Super Mario Party was on the Switch. I'd love to see them tackle this kind of game again, especially with the huge roster of characters in CTR Nitro Fueled, including cameos from Spyro. I think we could get a really damn good looking and incredibly fun party game with lots of characters duking it out. With that though comes the conclusion of yet another Bandicoot month. So thank you so much for joining me this year and my new wife of course. And even though nowadays Naughty Dog is spending far too much time being naughty dogs, I'd like to end this video with a thank you. Because without you Naughty Dog, I wouldn't be here right now. But do you have a copy of Smash Brandy's Cooch? Subscribe and hit that bell. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter. Please, I'll give you a tickle. Special thank you to my executive producers on my Patreon page in the description below. Matthew Hubble, Tardis Type 40, Exopaz, Ramen Wolf 1485, Red Eyed Critic, AD Thornton Smith, Mitchell Reed, Fart Rules, Skullman, Basil, Daniel and Alex, X Shadow Hunter ZX, The Game Shed, Slow Ponk, Steven LeBlanc, Calvin Cascella, Dave Marshall, Ingvald Pettersson, Carl Burke, Matthew Gunthorpe, Danny Coverubius, Lizzie Lizzie in a Tizzy, Ethan Spencer, and Yugi Brony. Stan? Every moment you're not running, I'm only getting closer. <laughs>